Originally, my goal with this video was to show you how to photograph the Pinwheel Galaxy with a dedicated astro camera and a telephoto lens. And that's what I tried to do last night. I spent about an hour messing around with everything and I just could not get it to work. So in light of what happened, uh, the main focus of this video is actually gonna be the problems that you're gonna encounter if you wanna use a telephoto lens with your dedicated astro camera. Now what I wanna do is walk you through all the problems I had last night step by step. That way you have an idea of what you're in for if you wanna give this a try for yourself. The first problem I have, and I mentioned this I think in the back focus video or one of the other ones in the course, but with this lens here, this is the Tamron 150 to 600, the original version of that lens, it has a mechanical aperture dial here on the back. And if you were to take everything off, you'd see that. What that means is that by default, the camera lens is always gonna be set to the smallest possible aperture. And that means hardly any light is gonna come through here to the back of the camera. The only way around that is to find a way to manually force that little lever and keep the aperture open. Now, there's a lot of different ways you can do that. To be honest, I haven't really experimented with any of them. In fact, somebody even sent me an email with a cool little adapter you can buy. And what that would do is it would go right here somewhere. I don't know how it would affect the back focus, if any. That's something you'd have to consider. But what it would do essentially is keep that mechanical little dial held open. That way you're always at the maximum aperture for your lens. And again, the problem I had last night was just that no matter what I do, I was hardly getting any light. And I made it very hard to find anything at all other than the brightest stars in the sky. On ZWO's website, they recommend getting like a little orthodontic rubber band and using that, but I don't have those and I didn't really know how to do that. So again, you know, when you're using different pieces and parts like this, you tend to not realize the problems until you're out there on location. So that was the first big thing I had is that the aperture was stuck completely closed down. There's plenty of lenses out there though, including like potentially even the new version of this lens that don't have that issue where by default they're wide open apertures and you're gonna get all the light that you want. And uh, if you have one of those, you're gonna be in pretty good shape. So hopefully you're in that scenario and there's one less problem you're gonna have to deal with. The next problem I had was actually with the ASIR Pro. And what I found is that if you have it connected to the home station mode, I talked about this in one of the earlier videos here in the course, but essentially if you turn on home station mode, the ASIR is gonna to connect to your home Wi-Fi network. And then at that point, you can control everything from your phone through your home Wi-Fi network. You don't have to connect to the ASIR Pro's Wi-Fi network. What I found though, is that last night it was just taking forever. After it took the image and transmitted it to my phone, it would just take so long. What I ended up doing is I swapped from my home network to the ASIR's Wi-Fi network, which has a pretty short range, but I was right outside with the camera like I am today. So it really wasn't an issue. And what I found after I did that is the photos loaded up like that. So I think in the future, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna connect to the hotspot Wi-Fi generated by the ASIR Pro when I'm doing my polar alignment and setting up my guiding and taking my test photos. Once I've got everything ready to go though, then I'll swap back over to my home Wi-Fi and then do the auto run. That way I get the best of both worlds. I get the fast transmitting times when I actually care about it and then when I'm sitting in the house letting this thing run, I can just glance over it. And even if it takes a while to load, it doesn't matter. I'm not sitting there staring at the screen. Moving on, the other big problem I had last night was of course, finding the Pinwheel Galaxy. It's really small. And I figured this would be the way to do it. Get a big telephoto lens, a small little camera sensor, and that should make for an awesome image. But what I found is that even with the help of a laser pointer, I could just not find the object in the screen at all. And that's when I really started to miss having the Batnov mask like I have on my SpaceCat telescope because it really does help. I mean, to be honest, the stars were fairly sharp even just with a rough focus on here, but having that Batnov mask and knowing that your focus is precise just by seeing that pattern really does help and save you a lot of time out here in the field. And in the case of last night, like I said, I, the stars were fairly sharp, but since hardly any light was coming through, I just could not find the Pinwheel Galaxy. I spent about an hour with no luck. I also tried finding the Whirlpool Galaxy. No luck with that either. Even though I knew exactly in the sky where they were, I attached a laser pointer even. And when I turned on the laser pointer, I could instantly see where everything was aimed up at. Even with those two things, it was still very hard. And in fact, it turned out to be impossible to find either of those little tiny galaxies. And that's where you'd be much better off rather than using a Sky Guider Pro or a Star Tracker like the Star Adventure. If you had a go-to mount, you could just type in Whirlpool Galaxy or Pinwheel and it's automatically gonna move everything right to that location. 
and you can start shooting. That really is one of the big benefits of having a go-to mount compared to a little star tracker like this. And when you're trying to photograph those little tiny galaxies, it really becomes uh, apparent just how much of a pain these are to use for that kind of work. Oddly enough, you know, like I said, I spent about an hour trying to find the object with zero luck whatsoever. So I said, you know what, forget it. I'm gonna swap over the Space Cat. Within five minutes of setting up the Space Cat, I found the Whirlpool Galaxy and I was up and running. And that was surprising because I didn't think it'd be that much easier, but it was. So that just goes to show you, if you get a nice little telescope compared to trying to mix and match things like I have here, it really can make your night a lot easier. One thing I wanna note here, if you do have the laser pointer, I know in a lot of countries you can't get them, and if you're in that case, uh, that sucks because these really do help if you're using a star tracker to find your object. But one of the problems I was having is that the laser would kind of shift just a little bit and that would completely throw off my alignment because I think I'm aimed up here when in reality I'm down here. So if you ever want to try this method where you rubber band a, uh, a laser pointer around your lens, just really make sure that everything is on the same axis so that way the laser pointer is not pointing up or down at all because that will really screw you up and it could waste a lot of time at night. Another issue you're gonna encounter with this particular setup is that there's no way to attach an auto guider and guide scope if you wanna go that route. And in this case, I didn't use one, didn't really need one because I didn't find anything. But you know, if you had a legitimate telescope, usually those come with rings or little adapters where you could attach your guide scope. Telephoto lenses usually don't have that ability though. And even if you had a DSLR attached here, then you could attach it to the hot shoe, which doesn't really work as well as I would have liked, or the L bracket if your camera has one. That's what I've been doing lately. So it's actually more versatile to use a DSLR in some scenarios. However, I was actually talking to my buddy Stu down in New Zealand last night. I pulled an all-nighter trying to get all this done, and he showed me a really cool little object from ZWL that I'm thinking about buying, where you attach a little bracket around your camera like this, and then from what I can tell, you can either mount a guide scope on top of that bracket or you can flip everything upside down and now you can mount your camera to a ball head and that brings me over to using your camera with a wide angle lens that's something i really wanted to try this year was using this camera with my nikon 14 to 24 for milky way photography and then i realized there's no way to mount it and to be honest i feel really dumb for not even thinking about this because i was really hyped to give this a try went set everything up had the milky way there and then i'm like wait, how am I even going to use this? So uh, hopefully you're smart enough to realize that when I wasn't. But obviously, you know, if I'm trying to mount this on my SkyGuider Pro, how am I going to do that? There's no way with this configuration to safely mount it. And that's where that little adapter that wraps around the camera might actually work. The main problem though, is that the lens, especially this wide angle lens is so front heavy that I'd be really worried about putting my center point on the ball head right here. I could just see this really putting a lot of strain on it. So that's why I'm still hesitant about buying that piece, but at least there's something out there to attempt that with, because otherwise, I mean, unless anybody is pretty ingenious, I can't think of any way to mount this on a Skyguider Pro. The only thing I could think of is I've put this on like a little sandbag mount, but then obviously you can't do any tracking or anything. So again, the whole point I'm trying to get across here is I was really excited to use a dedicated astro camera and filter wheel with my various lenses, only to realize that the reality of the situation is they're not really gonna work uh, at all, or in some cases, nowhere near as well as I would have thought. All right, well, I think I've gone on long enough today and sunset, so I gotta get back into town. If you remember from the start of the video, my whole point originally was gonna be to show you how to photograph the pinwheel galaxy with your dedicated astro camera and a telephoto lens. Unfortunately though, Actually, it's probably for the best because you got to see really what happens where even us YouTube astrophotographers, it might seem like we have the best luck in the world and everything just works out, but uh, it happens to all of us. You might have finally a clear night with no clouds and no moon, picture perfect night. You go out there, you're all excited. You set everything up and then you just have problem after problem after problem. Maybe it's your camera's not working right. You can't get the lens focused. The star tracker's acting up the software is not really working correctly, whatever it is, uh, it can be pretty frustrating to spend an hour or two, maybe even the whole night and not get a single photo. Just know that it happens to everybody. And the best thing you can do is just kind of figure out what went wrong and try and figure that out before your next clear night. Looking ahead to the rest of the dedicated astro course, there's still quite a few topics I want to cover, including live stacking and using a laptop or the ASIR Pro to control your go-to mount. 
I don't have a go-to mount yet. I'm hoping to get one here in the next couple of months because there's a lot of fun things you can do with that. Even just getting to your objects in a couple of seconds compared to spending five, 10 minutes trying to find it manually, that can really help out. But uh, that's all we got today. So stay tuned and I'll see you guys another week or two for another video.